this evening we are to talk on the subject of the solar symbolism as it relates uh, to the mystery of the Messiah, as this mystery was understood by ancient peoples. In order to get a little background for this theme, we want to go a little further in establishing our great system of astronomical symbolism. <clears throat> About 300 years before the beginning of the Christian era, there lived a man by the name of Erathus. He came from the area of Soli, which is now Cilicia, and it was from this same region, region that St. Paul came. It may therefore be due to this and to the great esteem in which Eratus was held that he is considered today as the only non-Christian writer, uh, non-Jewish uh, writer, to be quoted in the New Testament. The quotation occurs in the 17th chapter of St. Paul. Paul is speaking in Athens at his famous sermon given by the altar of the unknown God. And he says in addressing the Athenians, as your poets have said, referring to God, we are his offspring. This is from the fifth line of the phenomena of Herodotus of Soli. Herodotus was no astronomer, and yet Weirdly or strangely enough, we regard him today as one of the most important figures in the history of astronomical research. He was a physician, a man of letters, an outstanding poet, and spent the, the second part of his life, second half, in the court of the king of Macedonia. The king was very much interested in the astronomical researches of a previous scholar, who had left a number of verses and also considerable prose material under the general title, The Appearances. This title meant to imply the appearances of the heavens at different seasons and times. Arata took the original notes and composed a magnificent poem of about 800 verses. In this poem, he epitomizes for us the astronomical knowledge of his time, a knowledge which was largely observational. But he gives us a number of things to think about, which have endeared him to the memory of the world. First of all, he indicates through his poem very clearly that at this time, his day, the great system of constellational symbols, which we know now, was already thoroughly established. He also tells us in the poem that these symbols had descended to his day from a remote and unknown antiquity. There is a, almost always an association between Arathus and the Greek scholar, statesman, and philosopher Thales. Thales went to Egypt about the 6th century B.C., and perhaps from the Egyptians learned of the mysteries of the heavens. In any event, he is by legend accredited with the invention of a heavenly sphere, that is, a kind of globe, like our terrestrial globe. The outer surface of this sphere, studded with stars, and connected together to form the outlines of the constellations. So the ancients by the 6th century B.C. definitely had a spherical concept of the heavens, and they had made a kind of map or chart of all the constellations and the orbits of the planets and most of the other basic astronomical phenomena. The record left by Arathus of Stoli based upon these earlier writings and traditions, have ma have, has made possible the uranographic charts and the system which we now use in representing 
the phenomena of the sky. So he was a very important man. And he gave us, in his poem, a great number of legends showing the close association in the Greek mind, the Near Eastern mind in general, between these star groupings and the great systems of myths, legends, and fables, which have always formed a part of Greek culture. Uh, Rathas points out that in all probability the star groups were named for the exploits and for the uh, various deities and the various symbols with which they were associated. As for example, the wonderful exploit of the Argonautic expedition was preserved in the heavens in the form of the constellation Argo, the ship. Now we also realize that in Greek myths, when a human being achieved a very heroic estate and became uh, more than human, he was in the end frequently picked up and carried into the sky to form a star or a constellation. Several mortals were so honored. This probably merely tells us uh, that the physical or human exploits of the person became part of the astronomical lore of the people. Therefore, when we point out certain parallels in symbolism between astronomy and religion, as has been rather clearly set forth by numbers of writers in their astrotheological dissertations, we do not mean to imply that our religion merely began as star worship. Rather, we mean to convey the idea that by degrees we bestowed upon the heavens certain concepts which arose within the human being himself. The heavens were like a vast mirror sparkling with lights. And man looking into this magic mirror of the sky, saw rising before his mental eye strange visions, wonderful symbolic patterns. And the more he meditated upon these, uh, the more he filled them in out of his own understanding until the strange dark mystery of night became indeed a processional of wonderful figures, symbols, and devices. By degrees, man interpreted the lives of deities and of heroes in terms of the sidereal elements and factors. In his study of the heavens, man was immediately impressed by that powerful star which was for him the giver of light. That star is the sun. Men of old did not worship the sun. They represented it, however, as the most appropriate symbol of the eternal source of life and light. Seeking for words which failed, for various devices which were inadequate, any means they could imagine by which they could honor the great giver of life, ancient man could find no emblem more splendid no symbol more appropriate, no device more essentially truthful than this blazing orb of day. So throughout the world, at all ages and times, the sun became associated with religion. <coughs> it was associated because, as the great burial after Tom, Amenhotep IV, pointed out, that the sun is the nourisher, the life giver. It shines upon both the just and the unjust. It recognizes no difference in creed or color or race. It is not denied to one people and given to another. The grain of the believer and the unbeliever planted in the earth will sprout with the light of the sun. The sun, therefore, is a universal concept. It belongs to no time. It bears upon itself no strange limiting symbols belonging to one 
group of culture or another. It is the ever-splendid orb of day. It is that which lift, lifted man from the terror of night. In ancient times, men were afraid of darkness. They huddled in their caves and huts through the long, dark hours of night, fearful of strange animals and of disasters which came to those who wandered about in darkness. But with the rising of the sun, the world of realities was once more revealed. The ghosts retired, the demons were no longer powerful. The spirits of the dead returned to their graves. And just as the story of the crowing of the cock heralded the end of the dance macabre, the strange dance of death, so the dawn, heralded by the Chanticleer, brought with it ever-renewed hope of good times, of happiness, and permitted men to see the faces of each other without doubt or worry. Thus the sun was benevolent. It warmed those that were cold. And while sometimes the tyranny of its rays caused great heat, for the most part in temperate zones where these philosophies were developed, it was a friend. A friend, the coming of which promised fertility, the time of planting. It was also the friend that brought the ripening of the harvest. It was also the friend whose departure in winter was a cause of the deepest regret. And the rebirth of this friend at the vernal equinox was the subject of continuous universal rejoicing. So the sun in itself was a wonderful and beautiful emblem to ancient man. Now the Egyptians, looking about them by the side of the Nile, where the sandy bank flowed down to the water, and where there was in good season much mud, which was the life of Egypt, observed a very curious thing. There was a little insect, a beetle, called the Scarabasaka. It was very much like our familiar June bug. But this little beetle was a very industrious little creature. It would lay its eggs in a ball of mud, or perhaps of cattle dung. Then it would push this ball with its hind legs backward, usually up some slight incline. And when it had reached the top of the little incline, the beetle let go of the ball, which rolled to the bottom again. It then went down and rolled the ball up again. Now this might seem to be merely uh, um, a fragment from Dante's Inferno, but actually this little uh, beetle was gradually rounding the shape of the ball. It was taking this rough earth and gradually producing a pellet as perfect as a child's marble. When all was exactly the way the scarabus wanted the ball, it was then able by this same strange backward motion, to push it along, rolling it on the ground a considerable distance until it came to the place which the insect had decided was suitable for the incubation of the eggs within the ball. Plutarch says the Egyptians believed that this little beetle actually rolled the ball into the Nile, or, as by symbolism, returned the seeds to the water of life. This beetle, therefore, was a very interesting figure to the Egyptian mind. And they could not divorce the idea that this little ball rolled along the ground it was very much like the sun being rolled across the sky. That the sun was a kind of a body which contained the seeds of life. And these seeds were rolled up the hill from dawn till noon and rolled down the hill from noon to night, a great arc of the sky. The scarabus then, for, became known as Kephara. And Kephara is a very interesting word in Egyptian because it has two distinct meanings. It is one of the titles of the sun god. And figures of the deity, Ra, as Kephara, sometimes are shown with the scarab over the head. Sometimes uh, the 
a human figure has the scarab for a head. But it was a definitely a solar symbol. But as a solar symbol, Kepra, if you analyze the word as the Egyptian used it, means the becoming, or to be, or that which is all marvelous and wonderful. By extension, <coughs> transformation, for out of this little ball of mud or dung was born the new living thing. It was the old sun god dying each year and being born again in the mystery of the annual resurrection. In their glyphs, the Egyptians sometimes represented the sun with the beetle in the center. And at some seasons, the beetle's wings were spread in beautiful color. And in other seasons, the wings were folded under the stony shell. Uh, the British Museum has one of the most magnificent scarabs, I suppose, in the world. It is of green basalt, representing the god Kepra. And you all know these little scarabs that we sometimes see in rings and things of that nature. Well, the great one in the British Museum is five feet in length, magnificently carved as the symbol of the deity of the sun. In their practical religion, of course, the uh, Egyptians made use of the scarab for a number of devices. One was to replace the heart in the embalming of the mummy, what is called the heart scarab, is usually about three inches in length, and was placed in the cavature in the body left by the removal and separate embalming of the heart. This scarab was inscribed on the reverse with lines from the Book of the Dead. These lines were in the form of a prayer, asking that the great gods of Amentet should hear the prayer of the heart of the deceased and carry him safely through the mystery of death into the beautiful world of everlastingness. The uh, scarabus was therefore the symbol of the resurrection. It uh, was a creature that seemed to belong to the earth, but it could spread its wings and fly off into the sky. It was an ungainly creature, but beautiful in motion according to the Egyptian concept, forever rolling its little ball back to the sacred Nile. Thus this became a very important solar emblem, and the great ship of the sun is shown supported by the claws of Kephara, the scarab. And the pharaohs wore this device as the symbol of their spiritual and temporal authority. Now we have a sun symbol, the scarab, representing not only the orb in the sky, but everlastingness the res resurrection of the dead, the restoration of the soul, the purification of those who passed into the other life. Therefore, the scarabus was hymned as the symbol of the God who preserves, the God who is ever mindful, the God who lifts all things from darkness into light. By this same type of parallel, the sun itself gradually came to be not only an emblem of life in the sense of the great generic quality of existence, it became the symbol of the restoration of life. It became the symbol of hope, of the restoration of all things that were dark and mysterious. As it rose in all its glory, it was the victory of, of wisdom over ignorance, of soul over body, of good over evil, of truth over error. In fact, it was the symbol of the total resurrection of the perfect world, represented by and personified by the great God of the Sun himself. In Egypt also, the Sun had many symbols. And in uh, the wonderful hymn to the Sovereign Son, the Emperor Julian describes one of the most famous 
of the figures of the sun in the later religion of Egypt. This was Asarapi, whom we know as Serapis, the great divinity, the guardian of the Alexandrian libraries. And we have some record from early time as to the nature and appearance of this deity. The Serapium, which was his house in Alexandria, North Africa, was a splendid building with a high domed center and with extensions like the transepts of a church moving outward. And this place was filled with books, the great records, the recordings and reports of men from the earliest times, books upon stone and clay, books upon papyrus and other strange materials, originally some of wood and metal, and a little later, some upon the skins of animals. Over this great library, which was said to have contained more than 400,000 pieces of recorded material, presided the wonderful symbolic figure of the Alexandrian Serapis. We do not know too much about the origin and meaning of the word. Serapis was not originally an Egyptian deity. It is quite possible that he came from Asia Minor. In any event, some temples and records about him have been discovered in Syria and the Lebanon. In any uh, explanation, however, he came to Egypt and became one of the principal deities of the great Greek dynasty of Pharaohs, the Ptolemies. Here in Egypt he found congenial resting place and a beautiful figure of him on a magnificent throned pedestal stood in the center of the library. The head of Serapis was a strange and noble one. Long hair hung upon his shoulders and a forked beard. Most remarkable were his eyes, which the ancients describe in detail. With all the majesty of this person, the eyes were those of a man of unutterable sadness, a strange brooding face, and as one old writer said, that as you stood and looked at it, you could almost see tears springing up in its eyes. It was called the weeping God. And yet it stood in all this learning with this strange and incredible sadness. The sadness as though it looked out with infinite solicitude upon a world of suffering. The robed figure of the deity uh, was mysterious also. Well, some believe that it was an androgynous being. Certainly it was not intended to represent the muscular or heroic type, but the strange, sad, slender scholarship that went with the sadness of the face. Serapis bore upon his head a basket filled with living grain and all the symbols of growth. In one hand he held an instrument resembling a ruler or measuring stick, which was used to estimate the inundation of the Nile, so vital to the survival of the people. Beside him he supported with his other hand a strange staff consisted of, consisting of the bodies of three serpents twisted together. And these three serpents each had a different head, one of the heads was that of a wolf. Another was the head of a lion. And the third, presumably, was the head of a bird. The wolf was called the head of the past, the lion of the present, and the bird of the future. And thus time was twisted together into a strange uh, staff which was used to support the mysterious figure of the deity. Serapis ruled his world, and uh, the meaning of his name, perhaps from Asur, a form of the word Osiris. Asurapi could be the bull of Osiris, the Hapi or Api being a form of Apis. There is, however, another derivation, namely that it came from a word Seraph, 
meaning to shine, the glorious. And we find the word in the Old Testament, in the Bible, also in the New Testament, as a symbol of the order or hierarchy of the seraphim, meaning the shiners or the glistening ones. In any event, he was a shiner because around the head of this sad, mysterious person was a magnificent aureole of sunburst rays. He was a solar deity. He was the sad, dying son of autumn the son who descends into the underworld and knows the experience of death. When the time came and the great library was sacked during the period of Theodosius, a mob broke into the Serapium. For some time it remained, the mob remained at a distance, um, almost unable to approach the figure. They were frightened, they were awed by it. But mobs and panics have no respect for persons or for gods. And finally they attacked the statue, tore it down, demolished it, broke the pedestal upon which it stood, and finally burned the entire library. When the ashes were cold, and men began to search for the remnants and remains of their own vandalism, the uh, church historian Socrates, not the Greek philosopher, the church historian, says that under the pedestal of Serapis, when they excavated after the destruction of the building, was found the monogram of Christ. Now this is peculiar because that pedestal stood there and was placed there long before the beginning of the Christian era. But in any event, uh, that Serapis was a solar divinity, we know. That this divinity was also regarded with some favor by the early Christians, we also know. For we are told by Clement of Alexandria, the anti-Nicene father, that when the bishops of the, of the church went to Alexandria, they held their services first in the temple of Serapis and afterwards in the church of the Christian sect. This deity, therefore, is another strange and wonderful link with the great mystery of the solar god. We cannot attempt a long and detailed study of all the solar divinities. But in every instance, we find in the faiths of men the emergence of what Carlyle calls the hero myth. Now the hero myth comes in so many forms, from the most classical and abstract uh, to the most common. Under the veiling of a story like Little Red Riding Hood is the old hero myth. For the wolf in Red Riding Hood is also the same wolf that was on the serpent staff of Serapis, an ancient symbol, a symbol of the devouring by darkness. For the wolf lurked in the night. It lurks in the night of the past. And many a man has been devoured by his own past. It is a ravishing wolf in the conscience and in the souls of men. Just as we are also destroyed and broken by our history in many instances, for we can never escape the limitations imposed by authority and tradition, which are also powers of the wolf. In the same uh, classical grouping, however, we go through Grimm's fairy tales, we go through the legends and stories collected and preserved by Hans Christian Andersen, and we go back to the great classic myths. Here we find the story of St. George of Cappadocia fighting the dragon. This is Apollo slaying Python, another form of the solar myth, where it is always the solar hero who must destroy the dragon of darkness, must save man, uh, from the sins and evils of existence. The solar myth also gives us Samson, whose strength was in the locks of his hair, especially in seven locks. And these seven locks, of course, are found in the Gnostic philosophy, where the seven rays of the great leonocephalic lion, the rays 
of the nimbus and with the symbols of the vowels and also with the signs of planets. So the seven locks of hair are the seven planets which distribute or are related to the mystery of the strength of the sun god. Samson, of course, is a very thinly veiled reference to the sun. Hercules, likewise, performing his twelve wonders, was a solar hero. And in a little different way, but no less important, we have Achilles and the strange legend of his mysterious death. We also find in the Nordic rites the Sigurd saga, Siegfried or Sigurd becoming the solar hero. For the sun is always the hero of the world, and it is nearly always represented as a radiant heroic being with long wavy hair symbolizing its rays, usually blonde or red-headed. Moses is said to have had red hair. This strange reddish golden light, the symbol of the mane of the royal lion of the sun, the lions that decorated the throne of Solomon, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the mysterious royal family of the lion of the Shakai family in India, which gave rise in due course to the birth of Buddha. The lion is another great sun symbol. The exaltation of the lion represents the sun entering the sign of Leo, at which time it tames, captures, or slays the celestial lion, dressing itself in the skin of the lion, and then presents itself as the hero to mankind, the skin of the lion being, of course, the 30 degrees of the constellation of Leo, where the sun is enthroned. Thus these symbols go on and on, but during the course of time, the symbolism changed to a measure because of the shifting pattern of human belief. In China, the Yellow Emperor walks the golden road of the zodiacal band. He is the same hero, and practically every dynasty of the world traces itself back to a sun god, like the Rajputs of India, who regard themselves as descendants of Surya, the god of the sun, in his wonderful chariot drawn by the four-headed horse. These four heads, again, of the horse are interesting because they represent the four yugas, or divisions of time, which are measured by the march of the sun. See, Chrysostom, the great saint of the Eastern Church, declares that the motions of time are represented by the horses drawing the chariot of the sun god. Always these emblems return, but you have to realize that in ancient times man did not know of sin as we think of it today. Man did not live in a world in which uh, there was the concept of personal responsibility for evil. In the first place, man knew very little about good and evil. He found only comfort and discomfort, life and death. Gradually he evolved to a point in which he began to worship gods and godlings and to populate the firmament with mysterious spiritual beings. When he did this, he still did not have any concept of personal evil. He did not believe that the gods were punishing him directly for the things that he did not in the early time. He believed that the gods ruled their world in their own way. Men were not too important in the life of gods. The gods created a beautiful world. Man could do with it as he willed. And if he willed to do badly, that was his own fault. The gods upon their Olympian heights gazed down untouched and unmoved by the acts of men. Then one of the earliest of the solar heroes, Prometheus, was introduced. And Prometheus stole a spark of the celestial light of the sun and hiding it in a hollow reed, brought it down to mankind. And the gods, because he had broken their covenant and their will, punished Prometheus 
and bound him and chained him to a rocky crag of Mount Caucasus and placed a vulture to gnaw upon his liver. And Prometheus, the friend of man who brought the sun into the life of man, was one of the earliest of the sun soul figures. For after his strange and wonderful sacrifice, the gods could no longer destroy men at their pleasure, because the spark of the divine fire which he had brought now blazed within each human soul, and man had achieved immortality by disobedience. It's a very interesting legend and a very powerful psychological theme. Prometheus, therefore, is one of the soul men who sacrifices himself for the good of the world. The story of the sun, as we said, can be traced in your Nordic rites, in the Kalevala of Finland, and in the wonderful massive stone carvings of Central America, Yucatan, and also in the paintings and glyphs of the North American Indians. Always this wonderful theme has to do with the light giver, the light bestower. Osiris in the Egyptian ritual was sometimes represented as a mummified body lying upon the lion-like couch of death, and all over his body grain was sprouting. He was therefore a symbol of life coming forth from death. Uh, the mummification of the Egyptian dead was a comparatively late introduction. That is, it came only after the great cultural system of Egypt had reached considerable height. The very earliest remains of the Egyptians were not mummified, but were buried in the earth in the neat chest or embryo posture in a circular hole or grave. This was to symbolize the fact that death was another, was another birth. To live is to die. To die is to be born. The Egyptians therefore represented death as a kind of birth into another world. And they represented this also in their solar mystery. They realized that the sun sank at night, but the sun did not die, although the earth became dark. They began to learn of how the tree in the wintertime loses its leaves but does not die. And the cultus aborum, or the worship of trees, developed around the fact that the tree, though seemingly dead, will live again. And one of the best known examples of that, of course, today is the symbol of the fir tree, which we use at Christmas to recognize the fact that this little tree survives the winter, remains green, and is the promise of the return of the sun power. So the sun, in its departing and in its returning, became of the most profound importance because man recognized his total and entire dependence upon it. Now, man also had certain moral qualms in his own heart and mind, and he began to realize that the sun deity, or the sun principle, the light principle, was in a strange way an unselfish benefactor of all things. Akhenaten and other great Egyptians, including Emenhotep, uh, realized that in a strange way man needed the sun, but that the sun did not need man. Some way the coming of this great orb of light was for the good of man, or for the good of nature, not really for the aggrandizement of itself. It was therefore a sort of unselfish benefactor. It needing nothing of itself, gave all of itself. Having nothing that man could do to make the sun better, the sun still did everything for man. Man could never repay. He could never do anything except perhaps offer his prayer and offer his uh, consecration to the works of the sun. The sun did not need him. And this brings us to a problem that is of some interest perhaps in modern thinking, because today we are very much concerned over the effort to find adequate definitions for deity or for the nature of first cause, and we argue back and forth as to whether or not 
God is a person, a principle, a being, an essence, a substance, or merely a continuance of eternal mechanistic principles in the universe. And nearly every title that men have given to the sun, other men have questioned and doubted. And wherever the solar deity has been venerated under one name, this name has come to be hated or loathed by persons of other beliefs. It's a very strange thing. But let us realize one point here that may be helpful. That in antiquity, in the days when the great appellations were given to the sun, nobody thought of them as definitions. No one was really trying to tell what the sun was nor what the power was that was behind the sun. No one was standing in audacity to define deity. All of these terms, if you go back to their roots and meanings, are simply statements of praise. They are individuals bestowing upon the mystery the most wonderful words of honor and of veneration that they could conceive. It was no effort to define, it was simply that man bestowed every title that was good or beautiful or noble upon this supreme symbol of his own existence. Also man, early in his experimenting in thought and philosophy, sensed that there was within his own nature a kind of life that was derived in some way from the life of the total universe. So he, as the Egyptian did, used the scarab or the symbol of Kepra, the sun, as an emblem for his heart. If the sun had a a place in the life of man, that place was in the heart, which was the source of man's life, and strangely more than his mind, the source of his light. For man's great light comes not from his thought, but from his love. And in realizing this, the individual who had experienced the mystery of the love of God was a light within himself, a strangely illumined being. And in his life, this great symbol of radiance flowed from him. And so the heart became the sun emblem. And the heart has long been represented as the source of man's spiritual continuance. When the deceased priestess princess Anufa entered into the presence of the great gods of Amentet in the Egyptian ritual of the dead, she came forth into the great court forming with her upraised arms the symbol of the Ka, by means of which she said, I am a soul. I am a being unembodied, entering into the state of unembodiment. And the symbol of her nature, her conscience, and her being was a small urn-like vessel with an ear on the side. And this vessel was the heart. And it was from the heart Uh, that the Lady Anufa spoke when she answered the questions of the great God and the jurors. And it was her heart that was weighed on the scale of the balance against the symbol of eternal truth. The Egyptians had already decided, beyond any question, that if the glorious light of space existed in man or had a home or a bold in man, It was in the aditam of his temple, in the inner part, which was his own heart. And Hermes, in his essay or discourse to his son Tatian, says that the divine power placed the heart in man like the pyramid in Egypt. And the pyramid also, a fire light symbol, was a representation of the heart as the symbol of the solar mystery. Now way back through all these centuries of descent, this overtone, this concept lingered. But as we say, men changed their thinking. And in the course of time, there arose a doctrine of sin. 
And sin in this case was separation. Sin created only one situation, namely that creatures who sinned were regarded as separating themselves from the good God. Thus by fall or relapse or by departure, spiritually, morally, or physically, from the cold, man created an interval between himself and the good. He was no longer able to see the God that walked with him in the garden in the cool of the evening. He lived in another kind of world, a world surrounded by his own kind of creature. But the mysterious upper world, the world of light, was closed to his eyes. He felt himself an exile, a strange kind of orphaned creature wandering the earth in darkness. And to meet this mystery and to solve the secret of it, the ancients devised their tremendous culture of mystery rituals. These were the sacred dramas and sacred ceremonies which were undertaken by those who desired to journey back into the light of the God. Always, therefore, in the Holy of Holies, or the Sanctum Sanctorum of the house, in the deepest part of the temple, was a sun symbol of some kind, a symbol of life, a symbol of power. One of the earliest of these sun symbols was the cross, because, as Plato points out, the Logos, or the creating power, impressed itself in the form of a cross at the time when it first uh, began the building of worlds. It impressed itself upon creation in the great signature, or seal, of the cross. Thus, in the temples, we find these symbols symbols of the attainment of man who must journey home. This journey home was through the darkness of ignorance, through testing and trial, and finally the ascent into the lighted sanctuary where surrounded by the priests and uh, those who had already attained, the candidate was invested with the great solar emblems, the emblems of his own regeneration and restoration. It was then also that he was given the little white stone upon the inner surface of which was inscribed his mystery name, for he was born again. He had come into the light of truth. The old systems of the mysteries extended probably from 2500 to 3000 BC down almost to the beginning of the Christian era. And then we have what Voltaire refers to in his description of the Samothracian rites, the mystery of a brother who was slain by his brethren. And we find in the old mystery rituals the solar emblem, the candidate representing the sun god, passing through a terrible tragedy, a tragedy of betrayal, of assault, of murder, of martyrdom. We find this solar emblem brought forth as a lamb to the slaughter. We find it betrayed. And we look back over the history of the world and we begin to understand something of this betrayal. In many of these systems or symbolisms, the betrayal was the result of the action of three persons who were determined to destroy the solar emblem or to usurp the power of heaven. Consider therefore now that the sun god, Kepra or Serapis, ruled over the great sanctuary of wisdom. For in the great library of the Serapium were the talking stones that told the history of the world. Here were the records of ancient times and of the achievements of men, the dreams and hopes that were old even 2,500 years ago. Therefore, Serapis was the symbol, in a sense, of the records of man's progress passed on as a priceless heritage from one generation to another, the record of man's struggle, his uprising out of darkness, 
and is coming forth by day out of the night of ignorance. And in this sense, the sun deity finally becomes the actual symbol of truth, becomes the figure of a reality which is the total of essential knowledge. It is therefore quite understandable how the decline and corruption of the mysteries could be considered as an assault upon the body of a god. Just as Serapis was broken from his wonderful pedestal and smashed to a thousand bits, so the ancient system of learning, which was the essential principle of united knowledge, was torn from its ancient sacred footing, cast down, destroyed, broken, scattered by the embodiment of three powers of darkness, powers that we call ignorance, superstition, and fear. It is the ignorance of the mass, the superstitions of false faith, and the fear of temporal power. These are the things that gradually corrupted and destroyed the great institutions of learning, martyred the teachers, crucified, poisoned, murdered, until the wonderful system of mystery initiation was no more, destroyed and corrupted, so that the temple was brought down like the house of the Philistines and Samson, the sun god, died in the destruction of the house which he pulled down with his own hands. So the house of wisdom, when it fell, carried the symbol to darkness with it, but also resulted in the fall of the house of the Philistines. And the world that has mutilated and defamed the mysteries is now itself weakened darkened, living in fear and doubt, living in moral and ethical uncertainty, wandering in a darkness, knowing not what direction to turn, still proud of its worldly wisdom, but afraid of darkness and afraid of its own sleep. These things then can have and do have a variety of interpretations. And in these interpretations, we discover many of the ancient beliefs and doctrines. Now, if you will study, as we attempted to show you in the first lecture of this series, the ancient relation of the zodiac, the solar system, and the sublunary elemental spheres of the earth, you will see that in the ancient concept of things, the sun occupies the middle distance between heaven and earth. Robert Flood, the great Rosicrucian mystic, whose designs and figures so influenced Kepler, was of the opinion, therefore, that in the great monochord of the world, the single stringed musical instrument binding heaven to earth, the sun was the central fret or divided the string into two equal halves. This also uh, was found in the Gnostic and Greek mysteries, and in the mysterious loot of Orpheus. If the sun, therefore, be suspended in the very center of the great system of intervals, known in Pythagorean astronomical music, it would be like man, as described in Gaeta's Faust, as standing twixt heaven and earth, dominion wielding. Above the orbit of the sun to the ancients was the superior world. Below the orbit of the sun was the inferior world. The sun was not only the symbol of the deity, particularly of the only begotten, for the sun, S-U-N, and the S-O-N form were almost interchangeable from the beginning. The sun was not only, therefore, in this middle distance representing God, but also, strangely, represented man. 
man some way belonged to the order of the sun because he himself stood like Serapis with his feet upon the earth and his head in heaven. Man possessed the power to turn his outward senses downward into the confusion of the material sphere. But he also had the power to lift his inner sensory perceptions and apperceptive powers upward and inward to behold the mystery of his own creator. Man is the only animal that we know that seeks to understand God. Perhaps others do not have to seek. Perhaps in their souls they know. But man has created an entire part of his life built upon the profound aspiration after truth, and even the corruptions of ages cannot prevent the gradual motion of man towards the emancipation of his life from ignorance. Thus man has the power to understand mysteries of the spirit, even as he has power to understand the wonders of the body. Thus between the two extremes, suspended in a world uh, of rarefied internal atmosphere, man has something that psychology and the Greeks both call the ego, the focal point of selfness. And this ego is like a sun in the center of man. And it is this sun which is in some way stationed halfway between illusion and reality. This symbolism should be of considerable interest to psychologists because they have taken in many instances the attitude that the ego or the center of self-awareness is the ultimate, that it is the highest part of man. The ancients said no, it is one bearing witness. It is one who stands in the midst, a psychopompus, an hierophant of mysteries, not a god, but a servant of the gods, not the master of destiny, <coughs> but the attendant upon destiny, for above and beyond the ego, as Plato tells us, the world turns upon the great spindle of the law. If then man as a spiritual core within himself recognizes his kinship with the solar mystery, he then realizes that the light that comes from within himself lights the lower world and that man's mind is due to the strange but inevitable death of the soul. Even the great god Ray himself could not withstand the sorcery of Isis. Even the deities, like the great order of the Odinic gods of the Scandinavian peoples, come finally to the Gotodamarum, to the twilight, to the destruction, to the end of the world, where gods and mortals perish together. Thus in the Egyptian right, it became very important for man to understand the mortality of his own ego. This in fact gives us practically the whole substance of Buddhistic doctrine. The Egyptian believed that immortality of the soul had to be earned, that this solar symbol carried not only the promise but the duty, the burden. For in every case the sun performs its labor for the benefit of men and dies in the service of the men it seeks to aid. Just as the sun at night goes into darkness to the underworld, just as the annual sun in the processional motion comes finally to winter and dies, just as the sun in the great platonic year moves through the alternative periods of fertility and sterility. So always, life follows death. Death follows life forever. The ancient was a fatalist on this particular point. 
But when everything seemed to die, the time came to remember its birth. When everything was born, it was then timely to remember that it must die. Always we should remember the opposite, because each of these stages is bound completely with the other. Therefore, in the effort to understand these strange rites, ancient man began to contemplate the very thought that we have in the Bible. There are two statements in different parts of the Old Testament which are interesting. One says, the soul that sinneth it shall die. And the other says, but the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Therefore, the soul and the spirit are not the same thing. The soul is the splendid light of the revealed sun. The soul in man is the witness to the Father. The soul in man speaks through Osiris, another solar mystery god. And it speaks through Horus, the only begotten of Osiris. And the God tells us that when we look upon the sun, we have seen the Father which is behind the sun. And we realize that in the Egyptian ritual, the soul as the only begotten comes forth as the redeemer of the body, just as the annual sun, reborn each year, makes available to man the immediate participation in universal life. The Egyptian was fully aware that all the life in space did not come from our sun. He also was aware of the fact that the sun as we see it was not the source of life. It was merely the one who comes forth, the witness. It is the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So the sun becomes the symbol of the evangelist, the manifesto, the witness. And it is the perpetual reminder that even the light of the sun, like the, the flame of the lamp, bears witness to a deep and mysterious fuel, and the light can blaze no longer than the fuel provides. So in Egypt, behind the great sun mystery of Rei Kapura, uh, we have something else, the dark mystery of the great old gods, the ones who never were revealed, upon whose faces the light of the sun never shone. They were the first, the only ones, the Sebi, the ones who remained in darkness, in their mysterious abode of the eternal north, where the path of the sun never came. And these dark gods were the gods of space and eternity. And this space and eternity, remote and wonderful, eternal and unconditioned, continued on its way through all duration, until from out of the darkness of this profundity burst forth the symbolic symbol or the symbolic form of the solar mystery. The sun, therefore, came to bind heaven and earth, came to unbind heaven and earth, for such were the powers of the Pontifex Maximus, that they shall bind and they shall unbind, and such were the ancient ritual terms. But the sun mystery brought the dark light or the dark life of the supreme cause into manifestation. And it also lifted up men, for its rays ended in hands, drawing them into the light. For as the sun draws water, so the mysterious soul sun draws souls upward out of darkness. And souls buried in the earth, like the grain, are brought into release into spiritual manifestation through the mystery of the Eucharist. And the Eucharist, in this case, is actually the power of water and fire, or sun and moisture. 
Well, by partaking of the mystery of the sun and moon, by partaking of the strange Eucharist described at the time of its first establishment by Melchizedek, priest of Salem, we know that there was the mystery of the corn, the wine, and the oil. And in this we find again the Eucharist performed at the Last Supper by Jesus and his disciples. For the bread became the symbol of the corn or the grain. The wine was in the cup of the sacrament. But where was the oil of Melchizedek, the most mysterious factor of all? In the completion of the Eucharist at the Last Supper, the oil was Christ, because the word oil is in Greek, Christos. It is the symbol of the anointing. Therefore, when Christ is referred to as the anointed, it is because of the use. We have the same word in Crisco, our present cooking shortening for oil. It comes from the same root. So Christ is the oil. The bread and the wine were provided, and the ancient ritual of Melchizedek was repeated, which causes St. Paul to refer to the Messiah as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. As the Scarabus Saka was said to be its own father and its own mother, being an androgynous beetle, so we find this strange priestly solar mystery also represented as totally and completely androgynous, like the deity Serapis in the ancient temple. Now the Messiah, or the Anointing One, gives us also another dimension of the solar mystery, because the rays of the sun work the miracles. The sun's rays lift all things and raise all things to themselves. Therefore they become the symbol of the resurrection of the dead, the restoration of life, and the redemption. The sun also to the ancients stood as the complete and eternal promise. It revealed to men in those days that the power of God could not fail, that the mystery went on forever, and that for always and forever uh, there was light, and this light was the light of men. And this light came into the world, and the world knew it not, because it could not recognize the mystery of the solar power. But the invisible sun, to Burmy and many other European mystics, was actually the Messiah. Therefore, as the sun was midway between spirit and matter, the Messiah stood as the intermediary between God and man. And none came unto the Father save through the Son. This mystery goes on. We find it in the Druid rituals. We find it everywhere we seek to understand the power of salvation and of life all of which causes us to wonder whether much of our symbolism has not actually come down to us from the very old patterns of things. We do not understand the symbols today in this context. We do not apply them or associate them to the great faiths of long ago, but such association is valid. For we have inevitably drawn upon the older legends and myths and have incorporated them into our sacraments, into practically every form of religion and worship that we know today in all parts of the world. This, if this be true then, and there is no doubt that it is true, we must wonder how far we can carry the analogy safely. Because we know that all symbols fall short of the principles for which they stand, no symbol can be in every way accurate or in every way complete. Therefore, we can press interpretation beyond a legitimate point and thus fall into error. 
how far can we press the analogy between the Son and salvation? How far can we legitimately assume that the ancient himself, searching into the inner life of things with his own strangely intuitive faculties, was able to integrate a really useful and practical concept. I think we must be careful. We can't go all the way with the old symbolism, but we can go further with it than we generally have. And in one uh, case particularly, I think it is valid for us to consider. And that is the part of the old ritual which dealt with the raising up of the human soul into union with the sun. Now in the Egyptian ritual, when Ani, priest of Pharaoh, entered into the underworld, he ceased to be Ani. He ceased to be himself. And from that time on, he is referred to in the ritual only by the name of the god. In other words, he becomes Osiris. To help the early reader in the dynastic days who might have trouble with this concept, uh, the scribe enters in here and there into the text words or something in this arrangement is that and now the Osiris which had been Ani, scribe of Perio, does certain things. The Osiris that had been Ani, the soul that had been Ani. Now this Osiris is again our Asarapi or Serapis. And therefore the deceased becomes a kind of godling and as such he enters into the presence of the great deity. He comes in the likeness of the God himself. He comes beseeching and asking in the name of that which he is like. Now this is very important in religious thinking because it brings out a point that perhaps we have totally neglected in our modern way of life. <coughs> Namely, the, pro the problem of the individual uh, creating the necessary attributes of his own soul so that this soul can bear witness for him in the afterlife. We assume today, rather smugly perhaps, if we have beliefs at all, that the soul is one of these things that takes care of itself. If it has been good enough, it will have a fortunate hereafter. If it hasn't been good enough, there's nothing much we can do about it except hope for the best. Now such an attitude toward the soul would not have been any part of ancient man's concept. He would have assumed a very simple point, namely that man, moving inevitably out of this life, goes into the sphere of Amentet, goes into the underworld of the night sun, goes into the abode of the winter sun, goes down into the earth beneath which the sun disappears at sunset. Therefore it enters into a strange darkness, a strange internal or invisible sphere. Now you have probably remembered for some reason or other that nearly always the ancients placed their after-death abode under the earth. Now we have no reason to believe, for example, that hellfire and damnation is just below some of the deeper shafts of the Standard Oil Company's oil uh, wells. And we have no reason to believe that if we dug down to the other side we would find perdition in the core of things. This is not uh, a particularly reasonable concept. Yet ancient man always considered that at death the individual went down, that he left surface and went toward center, in this case of the earth, that in his conscious period he lived in the light of the earth's surface. When he died he was buried in a mound or grave beneath the surface of the earth. Therefore, the underworld was down there. The Chinese believed it. 
The Egyptians believed it. The Greeks believed it. Always this world was beneath the grave, or perhaps actually was in the grave mounds themselves. Man went down into the world of the dust beneath his feet. The Egyptians believed, therefore, that in some mysterious way, man went down into the place of judgment. Of course, the Egyptian did not have any of our theological concepts. There was no place of punishment in the Egyptian philosophy. The soul either attained, or else it was devoured again by matter and returned to rebirth. There was no hellfire and damnation that uh, controlled or uh, ended the career of souls. Nor was there in the Greek. The worst that they threatened was a shadow land of ghostly continuance. But actually, the Egyptian was a psychologist in his own right. And his underworld, lighted by the sacred sun of the mysteries, was something inside. And the apparent symbolism is that in death, the soul returns into the core of itself. It goes back into its own dark nature, which for all intent and purposes could mean that the soul returns to the great hall of the twin truths, which is its own heart. The journey was inward from the surfaces to the center of things. And in the Egyptian ritual, the dark world of the soul was the inner life of the individual. When the body was gone, when the senses were gone, when the manifesting links and bridges between consciousness and objective physical existence, when these bridges were broken, the soul did not cease. It simply remained in what was left. And when the eyes were closed, there was only darkness for the sight. And when man lost his sensory perceptions and lost his bodily attributes, he was in darkness. He was in the darkness of his own inner life. And in this darkness, he could no longer be gladdened by the light of the physical sun. He could no longer see the great ball rolled across the sky by the Skarabastaka. He saw no phenomenal things of any kind. He dwelt within himself. And he turned, as the Egyptian tells us, and prayed in a strange aloneness, prayed for the rise of the sun of the dawn inside of his own nature. He must therefore depend for light upon the light of the soul, upon the light of the subterranean sun. And this subterranean sun was quite an interesting thing. It had two lives because it represented man's objective psychic center of egoism. When man slept, he died and went back again into his own inner life. When he awakened, he came forth again, like Kephara in its glory, rising over the mountains of the east. So objectively, in the daytime, the sun lighted his outer life. At night, it had to light the inner world of his experience. In life, it lighted again the outer. In death, it had to light the inner. So man depended in his state beyond the grave upon the sun in his own self or life. Now as the physical globe of the sun represented our objective consciousness, so the mysterious power behind the visible symbol, the soul sun, represented man's internal psychic existence. And the Egyptian was very much concerned with making sure that the sun of the soul shone brightly in the darkness of the inner life. It must be brilliant and strong that the plains of Alu may not be in darkness. Now these plains are these little things that psychologists refer to as our introversional areas of activity. 
the individual extroverts in life, in death he introverts. In life he pours forth out of himself. In death he returns again to live with himself. To live with the qualities and principles and attributes which are peculiarly his own. And there he comes upon the God of the mysteries. For if he explores the underworld and is faithful and moves through this labyrinth of mysterious tests and trials, he comes finally to the sanctuary to that temple which is the house of hidden places, ruled over by the master of the secret house. And here he comes into the presence of the midnight sun, the internal sun. He sees then within his consciousness a sun blazing in the firmament. And according to the Egyptian, he has a strange experience. For just as surely as materially and physically, when he opens his eyes, he sees a vast world around him, so psychically and mystically. When within his own nature he opens his eyes, he sees a vast universe within him that extends as far and as wonderful as the world around us seems to be. And in this inner mystery there comes the rising of the sun in glory. And the Egyptian represented this in the state of the blessed soul in contemplation seated quietly in adoration of the great gods, the soul suddenly sees the dawn of the disk of the sun, and Kepra suddenly opens its wings, filling the sky with iridescent light. This is the soul of the mysteries, which the ancients considered as the messianic sun. This is the sun in the soul, which is for the salvation of men. And this sun in the soul has to be earned, it has to be made possible. For when it comes, when it rises, it bestows immortality. For as the ritual of Egypt says, there can be no death when the sun in its risings bestoweth its light. So immortality is the rising of the sun of the soul, or the messianic sun in man. If, therefore, we remember the, the remarks made by Paracelsus, which we've discussed in a previous series, he said there were three suns, one that lighted the body, one that lighted the soul, and one that lighted the spirit. This would be in conformity with the old mysteries, and he probably learned this in Constantinople. In any event, the soul sun is the Messiah which is for the salvation of the nations. It is the sun of the soul rising over the body. For the final victory to the Egyptian was not the victory of good over evil. This was important, but this was covered more or less by the great negative confession of faith, in which the virtues of the deceased were clearly enumerated. It was not the victory of even light over darkness. It was the victory of life over death. It was the total victory in the consciousness of man. It was the entry of the soul into the awareness of the everlastingness. It was man suddenly knowing by the rising of the dawn light of Aurora, knowing his own immortality, knowing his own eternity, and dedicating himself to the service of the greater in the presence of the lesser. Thus, Kepra in his rising really brings the light of internal truth to man, an illumination, as it is termed in mysticism, or cosmic consciousness, was known to the Egyptians as, of course, the rising of Kepra or the great scarabus over the horizon. For it was the blaze of light that lighted not merely the outer forms of things, but the inner structure of them, so that their bodies were full of light. And that this light, and this life, was the assurance of eternal continuance. To achieve this end, therefore, the individual had to uh, not only make his peace with the 
gods that rule the world. He had not only to give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he had also to make his offering to the sun in its rising. And among the old manuscripts, uh, one uh, papyrus to the queen mother of one of the ancient pharaohs is, is very beautiful because we learn from it so much of the philosophy of these people, something that we know so little about, unfortunately. And we learn from these fragments uh, the tremendous challenge of man seeking the path of light in his own soul. Not merely just doing good, but the strange state of being good. Not only performing all the different rituals and rites that are indicated by our laws, our customs, and our traditions, but more than this, the searching after the experience of the rising of the sun. That in some way, while we live, we must have some pre-awareness of this coming of the great light of the world. For this coming of the great light is the restoration of the martyred God. And it is brought about by the dedication of man to the experience of the light seeker. The orders of the quest in medieval chivalry emphasize this older philosophy very clearly. So always the point throughout life was that the Egyptian, even while he lived, was ever mindful, waiting, hoping for the coming or rising of the inner sun. And he knew the rising of this sun by various ways, most important perhaps being that it brought with it the light of peace. The rising of the sun of truth inside of man is always marked by the increase of internal awareness of value. Man gradually finds that this daybreak, this auroral dawn, as Bainey calls it, ends the striving and the stress. It ends also the shock that flesh is heir to, for it is the coming of warmth, of life, of generation, of all good things within the soul of man. Just as man lives physically like his savage forebears, no longer in physical darkness, because this darkness is now riddled with light but in a state of internal darkness. Man lives in an everlasting night of doubt, burdened from day to day with problems and responsibilities. He finds the path of life not happy, nor can he guard and govern well the values that he has. He sees the world around him on the brink of war and catastrophe. He observes how knowledge is used to destroy both peace and hope. A man is therefore like his savage ancestor, huddling by the little fire he has, afraid of the great darkness which surrounds him. And the little fire is his learning, his knowledge, his faith, his hope. Such flickering rays as he has been able to kindle out of the long pathetic history of his kind. But when comes the great dawn, the darkness is no more. St. George slays the dragon with the spear of light. It is the same spear which, according to Omar, touches the turret of the Sultan's palace. It is this great light of inner understanding, the alchemical agent that transforms fear into faith, ignorance into wisdom, superstition into insight. These things man has to accomplish by the rising of Kepler in its glory, the restoration of the sun god within the strange mystery of his own life. To make this more seemingly understandable, the place of the sun in the zodiac and its journey through the years, its labors, uh, were all carefully studied and analyzed to get the analogies that would help to strengthen the doctrine. Man born into this world dies from the world of life. And therefore, 
This is the entrance to the dark worlds of the mysteries. In the ancient zodiac, the Egyptians used the symbol of the scarabus, where we now use the crab as the sign of cancer. In all probabilities, the scarab is the correct form, and the crab is a more or less compromised uh, form, perhaps due uh, to the corruption of ancient designs or the transference of the symbolism to some area where the scarabus was not significant. In any event, the crab is the symbol, or was the symbol, and the scarabus of the summer solstice. And the summer solstice, of course, was the point of the greatest heat and light of the sun. Therefore, the sun took upon itself at that time in the procession of the equinoxes the body of Kepera, and the sun became the scarab in its glory. Now man, according to the ancient philosophies, in the Mithraic rituals, and of course Mithras is another solar deity, who overcoming the vernal equinox in Taurus flew the bull and bathed itself in the blood of the bull and became uh, strengthened or became the hero as a result. This was also an astronomical mythos. Perhaps it is this Mithraic rite of the slaying of the bull and the bathing in the blood of it that was the origin of the red shoes of Julius Caesar. For it is said that before Caesar could go into the temple of the deity and act as Pontifus Maximus, or high priest, he first had to rush home and put on his red shoes. Without his red shoes, he could not enter the temple. The red shoes probably came from the feet of the priests who were present at the slaughter of the bull, and therefore whose feet were reddened with the blood of sacrifice. By the time of Caesar, this practice was not carried on, but the red shoes lingered, like a great many other symbols. And wherever red occurs in vestments of clergy, it represents or is related to sacrifice or to martyrdom. The sacrifice of the bull or the sacrifice of Mithras, who was also among the martyred gods. In any event, the birth of man in the sign of the cancer or the scarabus was the beginning of the great journey of the sun. Now the sun carried on two journeys simultaneously. The first journey was its arch across the sky in the mystery of the year. During this journey it passed from the sign of cancer, which was the summer solstice, to the great autumnal equinox in the sign of Libra, and here the scales were set up and the great weighing of the cyclostasia took place. Here was the dividing point in which life and death had to be decided. And the solar being going on courageously beyond the point of the autumnal equinox was set upon by the three fall months representing, in some instances, uh, the murderers or destroyers of the hero, or the circumstances of this destruction. And, of course, Scorpio, which was the first of these monks, betrays the master with the kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane. The continual ritual finally goes on till the winter solstice, which is ruled over by the symbol of death, and death here standing with its scythe and hourglass is the reaper of all things. And here at the winter solstice, the great sun god dies. He is betrayed, he is carried to the great place of the skull, which is called Golgotha. And here upon Calvarius, which is a naked skull, the cross presumably was erected. And here the sun god uh, is crucified over the body and remains of Adam, the primordial being. Now at the winter solstice, the sun seems to stand still for three days. The old astronomers were unable to estimate any motion 
of the solar body for three days. Thus at the winter solstice it is said that the sun goes in or descends into the underworld and remains dead for three days. It therefore passes in the terms of its energy into the abode of the dead or into the abode of souls and there it remains for a certain period. It also remains in a strange processional for in the sacred rites the body of the dead sun god was carried in a procession a procession which bore it from the winter solstice to the vernal equinox. A procession of three days, three degrees, three months, according to the different symbols that are associated with the various faiths. Here again the mystery of the three days is restored, for at the equinox also the sun is not observed to move for three days. And at the end of these three days, at the actual moment of the equinox, the sun is reborn, rising as Kephara in its glory, promising the return of fertility after the long darkness of winter, in which the sun sleepeth, and all men rest, and the earth is without uh, light or nutrition. It is the problem of the long night in which life returns to the other world. After the vernal equinox, the sun marches in its splendor. It overcomes the ram. It rises above the power of the bull Apis. It comes under the power of the uh, Dioscuri, Castor and Pollux, and again reaches its magnificent arch and thronement in the sign of the scarab. Now the Egyptians say that there was a mysticism to this. They pointed out even in those ancient days that when men die, they most usually die in the night. And that when they die in the night, they most often die in that part of the night which just precedes the dawn. This is an old legend or an old fable. It is not necessarily universal, but the ancient believed that there was a certain tendency to a pattern here. They therefore further believed that in the so-called night part of the 24 hours of the day, or the night half of the 12 months of the year, the sun, by its mysteries, changed its vibratory pole. And therefore, while it is winter or darkness in the outer world, the sun becomes the particular illuminator of the inner life of things. Therefore, as man's objective concerns are advanced most rapidly in the period from the vernal equinox to the autumnal equinox, the diminishing of the physical sun is attended by the increase of the sun of the mystery. And therefore, that man's internal life is strengthened most during the period when his material energies are least exalted. So the Egyptians considered the period from the autumnal equinox to the vernal equinox, through the winter solstice, to be the period of great soul building. It was here that man's inner strength became greater than his outer strength. It was here also that because of the darkness of winter that had fallen upon his world, his ordinary and common labors were not fruitful. He could not go out in the snow and do the tasks of planting and reaping. And remember, all these things began in the agrarian period of our culture. Therefore, in the winter time, man had to remain under the shelter of whatever protection he had. He had to search for civilization in communion with those near to him. He had to invent and devise activities uh, which were not similar to those of the summer. 
He could not hibernate like some animals. Thus we may say that man's material progress was advanced in the summer, and his intellectual growth was achieved in the winter. If there had been no winter, we might still be in the Stone Age, because the winter was the time which men had to fill with an activity that was not material. Here was the time when they had to develop their cultures, their insights, their literary attainments, their artistry, and all the various forms of genius uh, which were made possible uh, because of the strange additional leisure which they had. If they provided themselves as well as they could during the good season and had put away the tithing of the 10% for the next year's seed, they then had security through the winter months. And this security was man's first leisure. And this leisure was the beginning of man's civilization. So in the long winter months, men grew as soul beings, or had the opportunity to so improve themselves. The Egyptians went further than this, however, by analogy. They insisted that there was actually a difference in the spiritual vibration and energy of the sun, by which the psychic life of man was most rapidly advanced at this time. That therefore man inwardly grew. The dark inner nature of him received the light of the sun that was taken from his body. His material life grew less. His spiritual contact grew greater. Therefore the greatest and most important event in the entire spiritual cycle of the sun mystery was reserved for the winter solstice, the midst of winter. For it was at the winter solstice, in the darkness of man's own first internal neurotic existence, that the messianic mystery was born. It was in the midst of the darkness of his own inner life that the first rays of the sun of the messianic dispensation, the Sotar of the Gnosis, was first heralded, and the three winter signs as three wise men came to pay homage to the crib of the child. All of these point out that in the darkness of man's spiritual winter, the sun of the soul cast its greatest light. This was perfectly in conformity with the Egyptian ritual, and with also many of the teachings of the Greeks, Hindus, and Chinese. Thus we have something that perhaps uh, is a little startling at first, but not as much so as you might imagine. For we have a strange belief in our daily living that through certain sorrows or through certain tribulations the spiritual powers of man are quickened. That man never seeks light as much as when his darkness is the most difficult and dangerous. In this, therefore, we have the proper inducement and if it be true, as the Egyptians said, that the sun's rays change their quality in the winter, so that they are attuned to the heart and soul focus, rather than to the body focus, that in the winter the rays of the sun pierce through matter, but do not quicken it, and enter into the psychic life of things, that in the winter half of the year, so to say, or the uh, descending half or arc, all inner things are strengthened. In the outer part of the summer and spring and early fall month, the outer parts are strengthened. <coughs> but it is the life in the seed or in the soul of man which is the most important. So the sun in our winter shines into the inner part of our lives rising in glory over the great fields of Amentet. The Egyptians are known to have used trances, hypnosis, and other similar devices in their religion. In this they were not essentially different from other primitive people. We know also that in trances and in sleep the Egyptians believed that they could come into the presence of the great gods of Amentet. Therefore, that in this 
sleep of death, in this trance, man had an experience of inner life. Always initiation and death were used as parallel symbolisms. And the individual internalizing, searching for value, must seek for this internal sun which shines in the darkness but is not known <coughs> by the darkness. If then, during this same season of the annual motion of the sun, from the autumnal equinox to the vernal equinox through the winter solstice, this sun is shining in a mentet. It means that the god has not died it is not that the god is dead, it merely appears to be dead because it sleepeth. Now this god actually does not sleep in its own nature. When Osiris died, he did not merely rest in the master bar of the tomb. He went forth into another lower region and there ruled over the quick and the dead. In the same way, the soul of man in sleep does not merely lie down in darkness. It moves into another world where it is lighted by another sun. In the same way, man searching for value, passing through the ceremonies of the mystery rituals, is moving into another world which is lighted by the sun of the soul. And it is this ever coming sun which is the promise. It is This is the true light that light is every man who cometh into the world, for it is the light within himself. And this light is strengthened more in that time when material things are less favored. So the Egyptians actually believed that when the sun went to sleep for outward things, it burst into glory inside of man. And that when it sat in the west, it rose in the east of man's heart. And when it rose in the east of the earth, it sat in the west of man's heart. For man's outer works were works of the light of day, but the inner mystery of his soul were works of the light of night, not the darkness of night. For there was no darkness, except man's own ignorance of light. And each day, the sun rising was like his own consciousness. For when he, when he woke in the morning, the sun rose through his eyes and through his sensory perceptions, and he saw the day. But when he went to sleep at night, the sun seemed to set, and he saw no more of the day. But the moment he was asleep, the Egyptians believed that he went into the world of another dawn. And here, within himself, the light continued to shine. I think Buddhism has much the same concept, but it points out the mysterious curtain which conceals the ship of the sun, that when it goes down over the mountains at, of the west, man no longer sees light. But man who has become inwardly wise is able to experience light, like Apuleius, who initiated into the mysteries, stood upon the threshold of Persephone the underworld, and declared that he beheld the sun shining beneath his feet under the earth. And so the sun of the inner world shines in the night. And this sun is our own psychic entity, our own psychic life. And it gains its strength from the sun. And just as the seed in the ground is quickened by the water, and by the ray of the sun. So the seed in the soul, the seed of the tree of life and of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, these seeds are quickened by the Eucharist of the fire and water of the sun. The Egyptian made much of this theology, and he declared that it could be set upon the great astronomical form and would reveal to us the deeper meaning of many of the common and familiar symbols, devices, and ideas with which we are concerned today. Now our time is up, and I think it's time for you to all commune with the sun in your own soul in the quietude of rest.
Thank you.